ritual practiced around the world. It was a woman who died a thousand years ago. Each culture has its own techniques, and many are very painful. You really have to realize. I'm traveling around the globe in search of ancient ink, on a journey to find tattoos, to learn their origins. How did you get his skin? Cut with knife. And to understand why they continue to evolve. My entire body at this point is tattooed. I'm like a giant coloring book. How did this tribal ritual become a cultural explosion? To find the answers, I'll do more than ask questions as I hunt down the history of ancient ink. If you've got tattoos or you're thinking about getting one, you're not alone. More than 40 million Americans have been inked. That's four times as many as 50 years ago. And over the past 15 years, I've gotten a bunch myself. Tattoos aren't for everyone, but clearly today, they're more popular than ever. So why do people around the world get tattoos? And how and where did this tradition get started? There are probably almost as many different reasons for getting tattoos as there are people wearing them. Rebellion, beauty, sex, warfare. Some are shocking, many are bizarre. I'm going on a global journey to explore the history of tattoos. I'm even thinking about picking up a few new ones myself, getting tattooed the way other cultures do it. Some still use some very ancient techniques. This is going to be a wild ride. My search starts in what many consider one of the most isolated cultures on the planet, New Zealand. This is the land of the Maori people, known for their warrior spirit and striking facial tattoos. I'm going there to find out how British explorers in the 18th century nearly killed off this unique tradition. I'm in Auckland, New Zealand on my search for the history of tattoos. Here, ancient ink practices dating back a thousand years have nearly vanished. But a younger generation has rediscovered this art form thanks to tattoo artists like Tu Dule. I'm headed to meet one of New Zealand's most talented artists, Tu Dule. He's bringing the famous facial tattoos of the Maori back to life. And he's going to give me the first tattoo of my journey. Knock, knock. When I get to Two's studio, he's already meeting with his first client of the day, Daryl Thompson. So, Two, what are we going to do today? We're going to be working on a piece that I've started on Daryl's back a couple of weeks ago. What, what's Very the piece? Much. Whoa. It's a good size. Yeah, I haven't finished the outline yet, but we're going to do some shading today. So, that's a good piece. Daryl, what does that piece mean to you? Uh, it's for my family, because yeah, they got my back. The traditional Maori design, those swirling lines and spirals, are all inspired by nature. And each design has a specific meaning. Daryl's ink shows heaven and earth coming together in the Maori creation myth. This tattoo tradition may look modern, but its origins go back over a thousand years. When the seagoing people of the South Pacific migrated to what is now New Zealand. Their body tattoos evolved to emphasize the facial tattoo called a moko. Each moko communicates detailed information about the person wearing it, his family, and his status. For women, it's a mark of beauty. For men, it's the sign of a warrior. The Maori custom for fallen warriors was unique. The heads of those killed in battle were mummified to honor their courage. Then, in the late 1700s, life for the Maori changed when British explorers began to arrive in the South Pacific. It was the first time these Westerners had seen tattoos. They were fascinated by the facial tattoos and soon began to collect the heads as souvenirs, trading them for weapons. But there's an unexpected consequence. 
Maori with Moko were deliberately decapitated, just so their heads can be sold to European collectors. By the late 1800s, the Maori stop wearing Moko, and the art form nearly dies out, except in the most remote villages. Over the last few decades, Moko has gone through a rebirth. A new generation sees it as a way to honor their heritage and express their Maori pride. But facial moko is strictly Maori. It's considered disrespectful for anyone who is not Maori to get one. So explain to me what your moko means. My moko is basically two birds. I have two birds on my face. One up here, um, which symbolizes um, a bird called the Manuarehua, which is a mythical bird. And the other bird down here is symbolizes an ancestor of mine. It means a lot to you. It's not yeah. just a, a pattern. Yeah, it's not just a design. Now, from what I understand, they used to carve into the skin. That's right. The traditional Maori method involves a chisel with a flat edge. A design is carved into the skin. The wound heals and is cut open again. A scar forms and it's filled with ink made from sap and soot. Two is one of the few tattoo artists blending ancient traditions with modern technology. The designs are old, the machines are new. I'll get you to sit straight up. Now I'm ready for my own tattoo. I want a design that will go with the tour symbol I already have on my back. First, two draws the design in marker. Remember, it would be disrespectful for me to get a facial moko, but two will give me a design called kiratui. This literally means skin art and is emblematic of moko designs, but avoids patterns that are associated with any Maori families. Tu has been tattooing for 14 years, and he's so good, he just draws the outline freehand. If tattoos felt like this, everybody would have one. Ah, oh, I'm chuck you in. This is from my nap. <laughs> That'd be a kidney. Yeah. After a painful 45 minutes, my back feels like it's on fire. But I know it's going to be worth it. That's exactly it, man. Thank you. Tu and I exchange a traditional Maori greeting. It's called a honji, in which a breath of life is exchanged. Thank you. Too much, bro. You did well. My first New Zealand tattoo, created in the classic Maori style, and totally unique to me. But what about the legendary facial tattoos? Tu has invited me to a village to witness a tattoo ritual that hasn't been performed there in 50 years. It's a remote location, and Tu tells me there's a good chance I could be the first American ever to visit. He's taking me to the Urewera National Park, one of the wildest and most remote parts of New Zealand. We're going to Mount Mongapahatu, a sacred Maori site in the heart of the park. We've been on a gravel road for the last, oh, I don't know, hour or so. The mountain appears in the distance, and we reach our destination, the village of Tamapo. Long drive, but we're here. According to the Maori custom, outsiders must be invited into the village.